If you would please join me in Ephesians chapter 6. And verse 18. Paul has been writing and speaking about the armor of God. He seeks to encourage them to, to continue to stand in the Lord and the power of his might. Reminding them that God has given to us everything that we need for that. As he, as he comes to an end of this encouragement, he speaks about prayer. He says in verse 18, what he's saying is, everything you've done, here, here's the means to that. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Our Father, we thank you that for Many in this room trust the majority. We could sing, It is well with my soul, with, with great integrity, with honesty. Because we've experienced your grace in showing us our sin, bringing us to the end of ourselves, but not leaving us there, pointing us to Christ, the mighty Savior. And so we thank you for new hearts. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that encourages us even in dark times that ultimately it's well with our soul. There are people in this room today it's not well with their soul. They either couldn't sing what was just sung or they sang it with, Lord, great hesitation. We pray today, Lord, that as the word is preached that you would please take this word, take this, the mystery of the gospel may no longer be a mystery to them and save them. We think of multitudes. We've already prayed for some throughout this world today. It's not well if they're sold at all. Take this message today and use it at Brackenhurst Baptist Church to make a difference that there'll be a whole lot more souls will be well with. Because Lord, you've used us in this means of prayer towards the end of glorifying your name through evangelism. So teach us, we pray. Help us. Help us to focus today. Help us not to be distracted. Help me today to preach with clarity. I'm going to preach with liberty. To preach with integrity. Let me pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This week on two occasions, Jill and I were having a meal with some church members. And in both of those occasions, at the end of the meal... They asked a question that they had no idea how much that meant. They said, what can we pray for, for you guys? I'm not sure that there is a, a deeper, more meaningful expression that comes from Christians when we ask one another, what can I pray for? It's a question that is a short one, but it's a loaded one. It's a question that implies you matter to me. And I want to know and I want to share your burdens. I want to enter your life. I want to give my time to speak to God our Father on your behalf. I want you to know that I care and that I want to do something to relieve you of some of your care. Praying for one another is truly a godly thing to do. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. 
In BBC, we need to do more of this. Can I just say this, that if you're tempted to stay home, if you're a member of this church, and you're tempted, and that's what it is, if you're tempted to stay home tonight, rather than to gather with your brothers and sisters, then turn away from that temptation to sin. And gather with God's people. And let God use you in your prayers to help one another in this body. I wonder how you feel when somebody asks you, what can I pray for? I oftentimes feel a bit awkward. And I feel awkward for a couple of reasons. I think I feel awkward because I can sometimes fall into the sinful behavior of self-sufficiency. And to admit to somebody that I have a need, that's tough. It's kind of almost a statement of that makes you feel naked when you confess, I have this need. Perhaps we feel awkward because our requests are rather shallow. For instance, if somebody said, what can I pray for? And you said that I win the lotto. That might reveal a lot more about you than you want to reveal. Tyrell was telling me that on radio pulpit, sometimes people phone in and ask him to pray for things. And one man phoned in and said, please pray that I get a Mercedes. And so when Tyrell prayed, he said, Lord, please bless this brother with transportation. <laughs> when somebody asks us what to pray for, it's, it is actually, our answer is oftentimes revealing because it reveals oftentimes what is most important to us. There's a sense in which our prayers, our requests, or our th thermometer that measures our spiritual temperature. And so when we were asked what to pray for, what do we pray for? The Apostle Paul, having told all the saints to pray for all the saints at all times, with all perseverance, says in verse 19 in my translation, and while you're praying for all the saints, he says, and for me. Pray also for me. But what is his request? His request is very simple. It has to do with the proclamation of the gospel. Paul is asking here, please pray for me that I will be faithful with the gospel where I'm at in my circumstances. Paul doesn't ask for prayer for liberation. He prays for prayer for proclamation. The Great Commission, evangelism, was his priority. And I would suggest that Paul's request has a lot to say to us as a congregation about what should be high in our priorities to pray for. And high in our priority to pray for must be the ministry of the Word, the going forth of the Gospel, praying for the messengers of the Gospel, and praying that that message is delivered in a, an appropriate way. And so this morning, I so we want to preach on this theme with two major points. Prayerful proclamation. The first thing that we can learn from Paul's request is that we must pray for the messenger. Paul, the great apostle Paul, says, while you're praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, while you're being alert to this end that you're going to pray with perseverance and supplication for all the saints, don't forget me in that list. He says, pray for me. It's a statement, those three words, and for me, or also for me. Paul is being very, very vulnerable. Historians tell us that the Apostle Paul was a, a very short man, that he was barely over a meter and a half tall. I was a giant to him. I was Goliath. And he was a man, though, who was very fearless when you read his ministry in the book of Acts. The great boldness upon his conversion. He's immediately going into the synagogues and preaching the gospel. He's immediately, boldly defying the, status, the religious status quo. And yet, when Paul writes this, he says, I need your prayers. 
There's a sense in which Paul was a, perhaps a, a missiological a baby Jake. Where did that power come from? The power came from God and largely an answer to people's prayers. Paul writes in this whole context of prayer about spiritual warfare. He hasn't stopped thinking about that. I was speaking to Tyrell yesterday. He, he finished. He started Ephesians long after me and he's already finished. And he was, I was talking about the fact that I'm almost done. And I said, how did you handle the, the passage about prayer? Did you see that as a, a part of the armor? And he said, well, it's not, he said, I agree with you, it's really not a part of the armor. He said, but I agree with you, it's also very connected. He said, I, I approach it this way, that you have the armor and the prayer is the walkie-talkie. Do you know, do you know what walkie-talkie is? You kids have no idea what that is, all right? <laughs> Ask your parents. He said, that's, the, walk, the prayer is the way to stay in touch with headquarters. To call, to call in the, the firepower. And Paul is concerned that this church, as they face spiritual warfare, they're, they, they've been given an armor to engage the enemy. And they're to engage the enemy, I think, primarily with this gospel, with this evangel. They're to be evangelist. But he also realizes he's in the same battle. And so he says, please pray for me. Paul knew he needed help. It's interesting that Paul doesn't anywhere blame his circumstances. And the most of Paul's ministry was a prison ministry, right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all written from prison. He's incarcerated. And Paul doesn't blame his circumstances. Paul was not a blame shifter. Paul was a man who said, you know what, I have needs. And what I'm going to do is ask for others to pray for my needs while I'm praying for my needs. We find ourselves sometimes in the midst of battle, needing help. The last thing we want to do is just blame others. That's so easy to do, and it's so spiritually immature. And it's so unhelpful. What do we do? We need to look to God and say, help. Look to our brothers and sisters and say, please help. That's what Paul does. The Apostle Paul says here in verse 20, an amazing statement. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. In chapter 3, in ch verse 1, in chapter 4, in verse 1, he speaks about the fact he's a prisoner of the Lord. I love that. I'm not a prisoner of Rome. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. The Lord's in control of this. Here he says, I'm an ambassador in bonds. Apparently, the Roman Empire didn't know anything about diplomatic immunity. Because here is this diplomat of Christ, king. And he's in chains. He's in bonds. But he sees himself as an ambassador. He's in bonds. He's been restricted. And he knows that God is providentially behind all of this and that God has a purpose. It's interesting that Paul here, nowhere does Paul ever, in this passage, he doesn't ask for prayers for deliverance. Romans 15, 31. And uh, again, in the book of 2 Thessalonians 3, he does pray that he be delivered from evil men. There's a, there's a place for that. But not here. Paul is saying, I have one thing on my mind, and that is the gospel. If Paul was around today, he'd be shocked at the prevalence of the prosperity gospel. The Apostle Paul, and I don't want to be unkind, but he would not be a fan of Angus Buchan. Because Paul knew that there are circumstances in our life that may never change. And that's all within the providence of God. But in those, in those providences, we look not inward but outward. God, how can you use this scenario for the spread of the gospel? Paul understood that he was on a mission for his king, and so he prays he'll be faithful in his providentially provided gospel opportunities. There's a wonderful parallel to this, and you can read it this afternoon, but Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 20, Paul speaks about the fact that though he's imprisoned, though he's in bonds, though he's in chains, he says, what a wonderful opportunity. The gospel has gone to Caesar's household. I mean, you talk about invading the enemy territory, he's right there. 
Here is Caesar who thought he was a god. And here was Paul saying, you're not. And people in his own household are being rescued to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Paul saw his imprisonment as a situation that he, in this point, is not saying, I'm praying for liberation. He's saying, I'm praying for proclamation. Someone has said that even when he requested prayer for himself, Paul's response and motive were selfless. He's praying for the spread of the gospel. Paul understood that though he was bound, as he says in 2 Timothy 2.9, the word of God is not bound. What does that have to say to you and I? It says to us that whatever circumstances that we are in, let's not lose sight of the reason that we are here. Our circumstances, ordained of God, sometimes if we're not careful, they begin to distract us from our main purpose. Can I share this with you as a brother, as a pastor, and as a friend? We pray every week for the gospel to advance in nations, in our own nation. But you know when, when there's the greatest feedback from the congregation in our prayer request, without fail, it's always when we pray for rain. When we pray for rain, there's a crescendo of yes or amen. We need to pray for rain. But can I tell you something? There's a far bigger problem in this world, in our country, than a drought. And it's a spiritual drought. And our passion must be for the proclamation, the fruitful, faithful proclamation of the gospel. When God puts us in difficult circumstances, we need to, as John Piper wrote that great article when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer some years ago, called Don't Waste Your Cancer. Don't waste. And he go, goes on to ex, just expand that. Whatever trial we have, don't waste that focusing on ourself. The situations that God has put us in has been for his glory. I, Jill and I met with one of our senior saints yesterday who's been going through a tough time. We both just left saying, what an encouragement. Here's somebody who's been battling physical ailment for a long time. And as we talked, she shared about a friend that she's had for 40 years that she's worked with and talked about. And, we, and I remember the years, and this senior saint's been here long before I came here. And I can remember some of the hospital visits over the last couple of decades where she's been terribly uh, ill or afflicted. And she said, and she described the fact that in some of those illnesses, how God really used that in the life of a friend. Because she saw faith. She saw the reality of Christ in the midst of this providential illness. As we find ourselves in difficult situations, we need to be praying, oh God, please. And asking one another, pray for me that I won't waste this. Pray for me that I'll be the evangelist that I need to be. We must pray for the messenger. We must pray for those who are proclaiming the gospel. And obviously I'm making an implication here that in one sense, all of us need to be messengers with this gospel. As we're going to see, Paul asked for a particular request for himself. And I would ask that for me and anybody else who is a messenger from this pulpit with the gospel. But this applies to all of us. That, that, that all of us need to be concerned about what Paul was concerned about. And that was for the spread of the gospel to the glory of God and for the good of sinners. There's people in this room today. You could not sing it as well with my soul because it's not. You don't know Christ as your Savior. And that's a burden for me. And that's a burden for others in this room who know you. And I can't save you. In fact, this lady said to us yesterday, she said, Doug, years ago you were preaching one morning and you said, you need to share the gospel with your family, but realize you can't save them. What you can do is be faithful with the gospel and witness to them, but God does the saving. She said, when you said that, I just began to weep with a sense of relief. But I can share the gospel that's God who saves. If you're here today outside of Christ, if I could save you, I would. 
If by, if, if, if by, if by, um, I was going to say eloquence, but that wouldn't work. If I could do that, I would do that. I can't. But God can. We want it to be well with your soul. We pray for you. But there's people outside this room that you know, and we need to be praying for them and praying for ourselves that we will proclaim this gospel with faithfulness. We must pray for the messenger. But the second point, and the last point, is this. We must pray for the message. How does Paul want them to pray? He says, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, or that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. That I might speak boldly. That I might speak boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He says again in verse 20, Pray for me that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. First of all, Paul is asking them, Please pray for me for opportunity. Paul's in prison. And I think in, inherent in all this request is, I want to be faithful to my opportunity. By the way, it's, can I just, can I just um, give you the end of this right now? In Acts chapter 28, the last two verses, it says that Paul dwelt in his own hired house, and no man forbidden him from proclaiming the kingdom of God. When Paul wrote to these Ephesians, that's exactly where Paul was. And the Ephesians and other believers prayed for him, and God gave him opportunities, and he used those to the glory of God. And no man was forbidding him. And even though he was incarcerated, the kingdom of God advanced. We need to be praying for ourselves for opportunity to preach the gospel. We need to be praying for us as a congregation about opportunities to spread the gospel. I said it on Wednesday night for those who were here. Last year was not a year of numerical growth for us as a church. And largely, there was, a, there was an inward focus, and a lot of that was, was justified as we dealt with some serious issues that were coming at us as a church. But it's no excuse. And the fact of the matter is, I'm persuaded that if we as a congregation would have a renewed love for the gospel, if we would know something of what Paul prayed for in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, that we would know more and more of the deep, deep love of Jesus... We'd be looking for opportunities to share the deep, deep love of Jesus. We'd be looking outward, looking for opportunities. This happens all the time. The other day I was in a, in a car accident. I was at a robot and boom, somebody hit me right in the, in the, back, in the back of the car. And uh, as I got out, shame was, you know, thank God for tow bars. And this lady hit me, and, and, and my vehicle was fine, but hers was like this, you know? And I'll be frank with you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an Apostle Paul, but I was thinking to myself, here may be an opportunity. If you listen to the gospel, I won't sue you. Every providential opportunity can be an opportunity for the gospel. And I, she, shame she had two, two of her kids with her, and I said, look, can I, can I give you a ride someplace? And I'm thinking the whole time, if I can just spend some time, you at least may plant a seed. And my best, best efforts, no. Nobody wants to be with me. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, wherever we are in life, there's opportunities. Look for them. And pray for them. Pray for Abbot Paul wanted to be faithful with the opportunity. But secondly, he prays for, and this is the main thing, two things, is clarity. He says, And for me that utterance may be given to me, that I, I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, as he says here in verse 20, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul knew that as opportunities came, he didn't want to blow it. Can I ask you, transparently, this morning... To pray for me. There's a reason that I spend hours and hours and hours and hours in preparation. And there's two reasons. I kind of funnel that down this week. First of all, it takes me a long time to actually figure out what God is saying. 
You come to a text, and you want to know exactly what is God saying here. I don't want to mishandle this text. As I heard Sammy Labalo preach when we were visiting there a few weeks ago, he made a wonderful statement. He said, if you mishandle the word, you misrepresent God. And I don't want to mishandle the word. I don't want to mishandle God. Misrepresent God. It takes me a long time to figure out what is God saying and then thinking through, how can I best say this that is clear? And if you're sitting there right now saying, well, you're failing, then pray for me. You can criticize until the cows come home, as they say. But pray. And say, I want those who teach at Brackenhurst Baptist Church to, to make this more clear. Well, pray for us. But for all of us, when it comes to opportunities that God gives us with the gospel, we need to be praying for clarity and then preparing to be clear. If you had five minutes, only five minutes, to share the gospel with somebody, could you do that clearly? That's a good question. It's a helpful question. I asked it to myself this week. Could I do it clearly? He said, Doug, you couldn't do anything in five minutes. Really? I think I could. <laughs> we want to speak with clarity. We don't want to blow our opportunities. It should be the desire of every one of us. We should look for opportunities to reclaim the gospel, and we should aim to do so clearly. And I do think it's true that the pulpit should model clarity in evangelistic proclamation. And I think that every week, in one way or the other, I need to be, or whoever is preaching, needs to be helping us as a congregation to hear the gospel again and again and again. And all of that has a way of modeling and equipping us to take this gospel message and to share it with others. So even though every service is not an evangelistic service, every service should have the evangel, should have the gospel. It should be evangelical. It should be saturated with the gospel. And so those who are not saved would hear and believe. But they'll hear of a Savior who died for sinners. And they will hear of a Savior who took the wrath of God for those who believe upon him. So they will hear that there was, a, there was a Savior who didn't remain in the grave, but he rose from the dead. And he intercedes in the right hand of the Father. And we need to say that over and over and over again so the lost sinners can hear that and be convicted and be saved, but also to remind us of how really simple yet profound this message is. The third and final thing that Paul prays for is not just opportunity and, clar and clarity, but liberty. Twice he uses the word boldly. And one time, the first time it's a noun, then it's a verb. But it's the same word. And the word for boldly here means freely, plainly. It means keeping nothing back, but making an open, undisguised declaration of the gospel. Paul is asking, please pray that I will have a fearless confidence in making the gospel known. You see, we need to be praying not just for the pulpit ministry, not just for our missionaries, but for one another. And as we hear about somebody who has an evangelistic opportunity at work and, or at school or the community, wherever it is, and Joel uh, Q oftentimes is, is asking us uh, in the men's prayer meeting to, to pray because he has a scripture union class he's teaching at. And, and what, a, what an opportunity to pray that help Joel, help, help jo, um, Joel. Joel. Help Joel as he speaks the gospel to do so without hesitancy, with fearlessness, with confidence. That's so important. Why is that? Because the fact that the message of the gospel is so countercultural. I mean, here's Paul chained to a Roman soldier most of the day. He's under house arrest, but here he's chained to someone who represents a pagan kingdom. And at one point he speaks about Caesar's household. He's in the thick of it. He is in the thick of one worldview, the right, true worldview, against the false pagan worldview. He knows who is Lord, and it's not Caesar. It's Jesus. And as he proclaims that, he knows as he proclaims, I mean, think about this. People are coming to him in the 
power and providence of God, the door is open for people to come and to listen to Paul teach. And here's this Roman soldier sitting there in the room, listening to this, these, the Apostle Paul, very tactfully, I'm sure, saying, actually, Caesar's not king. That would take some courage, wouldn't it? But Jesus is king. Pray for me that I'll be bold. That's the kind of world we live in today. We're preaching a message that is intolerant of other approaches to being right with God. And all the talk about tolerance, I have never lived in a more intolerant era than the last 25 years. There's tolerance for lies. There's no tolerance for, tolerance for truth. And when we say to people, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, we are in enemy territory. And it takes courage to proclaim that. And even now, the starting to work its way into our system. I don't know if you read this recently, but those now who are marriage officers employed by the government, they want to challenge whether or not they can say no to marrying a man and a man or a woman and a woman. It takes courage to preach truth. To tell someone that his truth claims are actually false claims. None of this we do with a harsh spirit, but if we love people, we've got to tell them the truth. And we can't cave into the fear of man. And even for pastors in a closed environment like this, it requires boldness. Not just because of outsiders, but sometimes because of insiders. And if I, do plan, if I do preach the message that I'm planning for next week, from Ephesians 6, it's going to be something that's going to require boldness. Because even some who claim to be insiders are going to be offended by it. Because it's truth. And it lifts the mask of hypocrisy. There's a great story about Spurgeon. Somebody asked him, he was a great Baptist preacher in the 1800s, and somebody asked him, what's the, the key to the power of your ministry? And he said, the key to my ministry is my people pray for me. It would be a wonderful thing if, if somebody said, the only time we talk about people is when we're on our knees. My people pray for me. Spurgeon, one day there was four young men. They'd heard about a man named Spurgeon. They'd never seen a picture of him. But they heard he was a great preacher, and so they went to the Metropolitan Tabernacle one day, and one evening. And as he walked into the foyer, there was a man there, and they said, we're here to, to hear Mr. Spurgeon preach tonight. And he said, great. He said, um, can I give you a tour of the building? And he walked around, and he said, let me, let me take you to the most important part of the building. He said, let me take you to the heating plant of this building. And apparently this happened in July in London, and so the last thing they were interested in was a heater. And they went to this big room, and there were 700 people praying. And the man said, this is the reason for the ministry of Mr. Spurgeon. And then he said to these men, let me introduce myself, I'm Mr. Spurgeon. The great Apostle Paul, if he needed prayers to preach with confidence and freely and boldly, how much more do we? We need it because, as I said earlier, if anyone's going to be saved, only God can do the saving. It takes God's power to raise those who are spiritually dead to spiritual life. It takes the power of God to take the scales off the eyes. People who have, as Tommy prayed today, I love that Arabian proverb, turning ears into eyes. And for ears to be turned into eyes, to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, to see the glory of the gospel, only God can do that.
task that is unfinished, as we sang about. But it's not a task that is hopeless. If we have a God who can create the heaven and the earth with his word, we have a God who can raise Lazarus from the dead with the word, we have a God who has raised multitudes in this room by the power of the gospel. We've been enlisted in God's army. We've been equipped with God's armor to engage the enemy in evangelism. And God can save our loved ones. And God can save our neighbors. And God can save our fellow church members. You know Spurgeon? You say 700 people praying for him. Do you know on any given Sunday, depending on the week, they had six to 10,000 people in that church? 700 people praying, that's actually a, a puny percentage. And one day somebody asked Spurgeon about his ministry. He said, my greatest fear is I fear that most of the people who are coming here, even those who are church members, are not yet converted. Are we seeing the importance of prayer? You cannot argue someone in the kingdom of God. If you can argue someone in, someone else can argue them out. It takes the power of God to translate, transport somebody from the kingdom of darkness in the kingdom of God's dear Son. And so we pray for the advance of the gospel. We pray for fearlessness of those who are proclaiming it. And I just appeal to us that all of us, God's given to us opportunities. I've been really just so challenged and encouraged in my heart this week about getting back to this. And having my eyes more open to being soul conscious. To doing the work of an evangelist. Not just here. But when I engage people. Looking for opportunities. Praying for opportunities to win people to Christ. Let me tell you this. If every mem member of our church, if all of us were as concerned about this evangelism as Paul was. Can I, can I tell you what? We'd have less problems to deal with. We'd have a bigger problem. We, we really would have a building program problem. And I've already got some solutions for that, by the way. In fact, some of them were mentioned by the congregation on Wednesday night. But I, I was thinking the other day, I, I can't think of my history in the ministry of people who have caused me problems or caused the church serious problems who've been involved in sharing the gospel regularly. There's something about that. There's something about the fact that we're keeping our eye on the goal that keeps us from biting and devouring one another. So Paul said, when Paul wrote to the Galatians, they were having a gospel problem. And he says, Let, he said, beware lest you devour, bite and devour and consume one another. When we keep our eye on the goal, we run this race together. As I said in the new members class today, we're, we're, we're a church of sinners and there's going to be failures. We're going to get back up again with the gospel and go forward. Does that make sense? So let me just say this. Truly spiritual prayer will be far more concerned with the proclamation of the gospel and the growth of the church than so many of those things that we become obsessed with. It's right to pray for rain. It's right to pray for employment. It is right to pray for those who are ill. I'm not, I'm not denigrating that, but I'm saying biblically, what's the priority? It's the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Let me just close with this. I love the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our needs and to bear. I should never start with a song. How's it go, Peter? What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. The Apostle Paul, you can't read his letters without realizing he was a man of prayer. But where did he learn that from? He probably learned that from the three years when he was in the Arabian Desert and Jesus had revealed himself and was teaching him and discipling him. You read, particularly in the book of Luke, constantly you see Jesus at prayer, Jesus at prayer. If Paul had to pray, how much more do we? If Jesus prayed, how much more should we? What does Jesus pray about? What, what, what Jesus prayed about is he would do the will of the Father. I read this week of these prisoners in, in Russia, one of the gulags, 
years ago, and a Christian man was, would pray every day, and one of the mocking fellow prisoners who was not a believer said, I don't know why you pray. There's no way you're going to be released from here. He said, I'm not praying to be released from here. I'm praying that I'll do the will of God. And when Jesus was praying, more times than not, what he's praying is, I want to keep doing the will of God. And I've come here to go to a cross and to die for undeserving sinners, but I love them. And the angels came and ministered to him after the temptation. And the angels strengthened him in the garden. And he got up and he said, let, he said let, let, let's be going. And he goes to the cross. And he died for those sinners. And he rose. And he intercedes. And he lives today. You know, your praying will not save you. But there is a Savior who prays for us. His praying saves us. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 7.25... That he ever lives to make intercession for those who come unto God through him. If you're not saved today, come to Christ. He will save you. And Christian, let us be encouraged. God wants to hear our prayers for the unsaved. He wants to hear our prayers for the proclamation of the gospel. The powerful, faithful, fruitful proclamation of the gospel. Because he wants his kingdom to advance and he wants all the glory. So dear Christians... Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the prayers of Jesus. He knew, who he, came, he knew who he came to die for. He knew who he would save. He interceded for us in, in the garden in John 17. He interceded for us on the cross. He interceded when he arose and ascended. And thank you for the hope that if he interceded for us and saved us, there's multitudes more that will be saved. Oh God, help us to increasingly know the deep, deep love of Jesus and then want him to share that with others. It's great that it's well with our soul and we thank you for that, but oh God, may we be concerned that it's well with the souls of our fellow family members and fellow workers and fellow students. Help us to Take advantage of opportunities you give to us and help us, Lord, to have clarity and liberty, boldness as we preach. And give us fruit. We we'll redound to your glory, to the eternal goal, uh, the eternal good of those who are saved. And we ask these things and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.